All right, if you will, turn to Matthew chapter 21 with me this morning. All right, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 21, we'll start with verse 28. Well, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? So they said to him, The first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed in him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So may God bless the reading of his word and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, again for this morning. I just pray to your God that you would just help us, Lord, as we read your word today, that you would help it, Lord, to fall fresh on our ears, Lord, that we will take this word and apply it to our lives today. And I pray to your God that you would just uh, take me now, hide me behind the cross, and give me the words that I need to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. When you think about promises, uh, we think about different things in life. We think about um, today, if I give you a promise, it's going to be written down in a contract, especially if you're exchanging something, you're selling something. An agreement between two people is normally now signed, okay? At one time, there was enough to say, I promise you I'm going to do something And when you promise somebody in older times and back in times, if I promise you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it because it held up to your character. And the problem uh, today is that we have to have written contracts to do that. There used to be a time to where a handshake was enough. It was enough for you to say, hey, you know what? Um, We're going to handshake and we'll do it. Robert here. Robert. Okay. We agree just by a handshake. Now, in biblical times, They would actually take off their sandal, you know, if they were going to make a purchase, and they would give it to somebody, right? Come on now. Thank you. And uh, so it was these times, it was these times that we would, I should have gave it to Amber because she was back there doing this with it. I should have gave it to you. It was in these times to where a promise meant something. A promise was your word. When you gave your promise, it, it should be something. The Bible says, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes, meaning that you shouldn't have to promise anybody anything. When you tell somebody you're going to do something, you need to do it. It's just plain and simple, just as easy as that. Shouldn't be none of this, well, I might do it. I'll tell you I'm going to do it, but don't do it. Then you're like the guy in the the story, right? Uh, Booker T. Washington describes meeting an ex-slave from Virginia in his book, Up From Slavery. He said, I found this that this man had made a contract with his master two or three years previous to the Emancipation Proclamation to the effect that the slave was to be permitted to buy himself by paying so much per year for his body. And while he was paying for himself, he was to be permitted to labor where and for whom he pleased. Finding out that he could secure better wages in Ohio, he went there. When freedom came, he was still in debt to his master some $300. Notwithstanding that the Emancipation Proclamation freed him from any obligation to his master, this black man walked the greater portion of the distance back to where his old master lived in Virginia and placed the last dollar with interest in his hands. In talking to me about this, the man told me that he knew that he did not have to pay his debt but that he had given his word to his master, and his word he had never broken. He felt that he could not enjoy his freedom till he fulfilled his promise. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Listen to me. That's exactly what it needs to be in our day and time. You're going to make a promise. You're going to make a contract. You're going to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you. You know, I was telling in Sunday school that I got this guy that that, um, uh, I tell, he says, hey, I'm going to come to church with you this Sunday. And um, I go to pick him up, and he's not there, not even outside, didn't text me or nothing. And this has happened quite a few times, and it's happened with other people, and his word is just not that good. Now, is he a trustworthy guy? Absolutely. 
Could I put $100 or $1,000 on my desk and know that he wouldn't take it? Absolutely. He's that type of guy. I know he's an honest guy. But to say that I promised to do something and not do it, no, I don't hold him to that by far. So when we say that we're going to do something, we need to do it. There's a, there's a binding contract with that just by our words saying it because that's integrity, people. Just when you go tell somebody you're going to do something, you do your very best to do that unless something happens and you know circumstances take over. And when something comes up and you cannot make it, you need to call that person and say, I will not be able to make this uh, opportunity or whatever you got planned. So the first thing I want to talk to you today is about an empty promise. An empty promise. There was a guy in the story that one of the sons, he said, hey, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. When the father come up to him and says, hey, will you go to the field today? And he said, oh, yes, I'll go, father. Right? He told him right up front that I'm going. The problem was is that he didn't go. He had an empty promise. So that's the first promise that I want to talk about today is an empty promise. If you will, I don't get you to do this very often, um, but if you'll turn over to Ezekiel with me, Ezekiel chapter 33. If you'll find, if you want to find it easier, find Psalms in the middle of the Bible, <laughs> go to Proverbs, go to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, okay? So there's about four or five books away from Psalms. So Psalms in the middle, go to the right and you'll find it. Ezekiel chapter 33. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet, okay? Ezekiel was a prophet. And in the first 24 chapters of Ezekiel, here's what he's doing. He's preaching a, a gloom and doom message, okay? And then in verses uh, chapters 25 through 32, uh, the first one, he says to Judah. The first 24 chapters deal with the sin that was in Judah. And he's bringing this to him, and he's bringing it to him bluntly, and this is what you're doing, and this is the gloom and doom that he was talking about. And then in verses, uh, chapters 25 through 32, he starts going around the surrounding nations outside of Judah and starts telling them that this is what you're involved in, and you need to change this, and you need to change your ways. Well, in chapter 33, and, and on further, he starts changing his message from gloom and doom to message of comfort. To a message of a hope, to message of future restoration for God's people. And so now he's changing it to a better message. But here in the midst of chapter 33, when he was already changing that message, here's what happened. The words that he had already said, there was a group of people that just wouldn't follow it. So if you'll look at uh, chapter 33, verse 30, he says this. There are the princes no 33 verse 30 i'm in 32 verse 30 that's my fault as for you son of man the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses and they speak to one another everyone saying to his brother please come and hear what the word is that comes from the lord so they come to you as people do they sit before you as my people and they hear your words but they do not do them for with their mouth they show much love but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song. Wait a minute. Let me pause that for a minute. Larry, do that again. Mm, yeah, that, that deserved the mm. Thank you. All right, verse 32. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song, as one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Now you're seeing that all of a sudden you see that this word has been preached to them. Guess what? I want you to understand that today, that just as in the day of Ezekiel, that people come to church and they want to be entertained. Can I get an ohm on that one? All right. All right. So now here's what happens. We come to church and we say that, hey, I like this person. I like the way this guy speaks and I like that. And we want to be entertained. Remember what we're talking about in Sunday school that, hey, you know what? To be a church member is not a country club. To be a church member means that you are coming to serve. You're not coming to be served. So all of a sudden, these people are coming to church, and they're hearing Ezekiel. Boy, he's got this, evidently Ezekiel's got this flair about him. You know, he's one of those charismatic guys that when he preaches the word, people want to hear him because he's a funny guy maybe. Or, or maybe because of his words are so powerful. There's something about him, but they wanted to come hear him. 
So these people come and heard Ezekiel's message, and he was preaching it to them. And he wasn't holding back. There ain't no doubt in my mind that a prophet back in the Old Testament times, they didn't hold back. Boy, when they told to bring the news, they didn't care if it was bad news or good news. They was going to bring the news whether you liked it or not. So they weren't there to what? To tickle the ears. They were there to step on toes. And there was some out in the audience that was hearing this, but yet all they wanted to do was be there. It's like a group of people that comes and says, well, there's a lot of people there. Let's go see what's going on there. And then they want it because of curiosity, they go hear it. But if you're going to church, here's the problem. If you are going to church and you're going to church for any other reason but to be equipped by the word of God, right, to be inspired by the word of God, to be encouraged by the word of God, to say now it's time for me to hear this word and to go do something about it. But the problem is we come and we hear the word of God and it's an empty promise. Here's what happens over and over and over and over. And I can keep going with that again in churches, right? People come up. They come up to the altar. All right, God, this is it. This is my time. My time to shine. I'm going to do it right this time. Throw up my hands and I'm going to do it right. I'm going to start being dedicated to the church. I'm going to start coming on a regular basis. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going to change my life, right? Then all of a sudden, the next Sunday, they're there. All right, we got some, all right, good. Now we got somebody that's coming. Third Sunday, you don't see them. They're gone. You know what that is? That's making a promise to God and not holding up to your bargain. That's like me giving you a handshake and not doing it when I told you I was going to do it. That's like me handing my shoe to Larry, you want it again? And, and, and not doing it. It's that agreement. It's a binding agreement that you're saying to Almighty God, the most important agreement that you could ever make in your life is to say, God, I'm going to do something and not do it. It's an empty promise. I'm not hearing many ums or amens or anything else. I know my main man back there that's normally doing amens. He's been in the hospital for a week, and uh, he can't do many amens right now. Because he can't speak right now, but uh, that's the quietest we'll ever see, Mr. Johnny. But, but hey, I know that you amen to me back there regardless, brother. All right. <laughs> and he, he mustered that one out with all the strength that he's got right now. Let me tell you something, though. If we continue to come to church, we continue to play these games with God, I think it's a very dangerous game that you're playing. I think when we say, God, we're going to do something, we better do it. Let me tell you something. You know what happens now? So then people, there's the other side to that. People say, well, I don't want to make a promise to God and then fall back on it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. So those guys never try. Then you got the ones that try and then fail. You got it? You see where the story is going here? So what does it take for us to do? When we hear the word of God, you've got to take that word and you've got to take it and you've got to, it's almost like you take it and open up your chest. That looked like Cam Newton. I better not do that again, eh, uh, Aaron? Uh, no. All right, open up your chest. Grab that heart, right? Open it up. Throw that word in there. Close it back up. Close up your chest. It's in the heart now. You've taken that word and say, now I want this to be a part of my life. So when I come into church and all I'm doing is wasting my time, all I'm doing is coming in here for whatever reason, if you're not coming in here to be impacted or changed by the word of God, you are wasting your time. You're making an empty promise. When you promise God something, go through with it. When you promise God something, go through with it. God wants you to see you to say, hey, you know what? And, and by the way, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Sometimes you're going to make God a promise, you know, and you're going to say, God, I'll never do that again. How many ever said that? Come on, come on, come on. Everybody in church better raise your hand. I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. God, as long as I live, I'll never do that again. Right? And you make a promise to God. Now, this is, this is going to happen. I'm just going to warn you because if I just sit there and told you that, boy, you make a promise to God and everything's going to go right from there and you're going to do exactly what you said, remember there's a human nature to that. There's sin that plays a part in that. So every now and then when you're trying to live for God, you're going to what? You're going to, you're going to stumble. When you stumble, guess what? It reminds you that, oh, my goodness, I messed up. The Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, and you say, I've got to change that, right? It's the stumbling that's okay, right? Now, here's another thing. 
Some of you is going to fall. Some of you is going to fall flat on your face. I would demonstrate that, but I might hurt some. Fall flat on your face. And let me tell you something. That's okay, too. Because sometimes you're going to fall flat on your face. I'm just going to encourage you that these things are going to happen sometimes. When you fall flat on your face, it's according to how long you stay down there. Get your butt back up. Yeah, you messed up. So what? We all mess up. Get over and get back on your feet again. Satan's saying, stay down, boy. Don't get back up. Stay down. That ain't God speaking. Jesus is there with his hand up, ready to pick you up. And Satan's saying, stay down. You can't get up. Stay down. Stay down. I don't want you up. And then all of a sudden, guess what happened? He loses. God loses a faithful servant because they fell down. They didn't want to get back up. All right? So there's an empty promise that goes along with this. So, And there's also an example of a rich young ruler. Now, we're in chapter 21. If you went back two chapters to Matthew chapter 19, you don't have to. I'm just telling you where it's at. Matthew chapter 19, there's the rich young ruler. Remember him? He come up to Jesus and said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What did he do? He was a sincere seeker. He wanted to know what God, Jesus had to say. Hey, I want to be in heaven one day. How do I do this? Here's what, here's what Jesus said. Okay? Obey the Ten Commandments. Let's just, just, just na- narrow that down. And he, and he throws out a few commandments there. And the guy says, I've done all that, but nothing. I got that one down. Knowing he's lying. There ain't no way he followed all those Ten Commandments all his life. You know that ain't true. But he said, okay, I can do that. This is easy enough. All I got to do is follow the Ten Commandments. Easy enough. Right? And then he says, he says, okay, good. You done good there. Now I want you to give away all your riches to the poor. You see what happens now? That empty promise that he was ready to make, he was on the edge of making it, and then there was a clause to it. Sell so away. What? Did you hear me right? Jesus, you know how much money I got? And you want me to do what with it? They didn't work for that money. I worked hard for this money. You see what Jesus is saying, though? It wasn't yours to begin with. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Nah, I just start seeing that stuff. Uh, give it away. Give it away. Give it away. That's what he told the rich man. Give it away. And you know what he did? He walked away with his head down. He could not follow Jesus. He could not commit to Jesus. He could not fulfill and say, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you with everything I got comes down to an empty promise. The second one comes down to an executor promise. An executor promise. Now, there's one guy, the other son. He's kind of a procrastinator. He's kind of like one of those guys that kind of sit back and say, I ain't going to do that, right? It's like my son sometimes. Hey, will you go do this for me? No. No, they better not say that. They know better. (laughs) But they feel like saying that. You know what I'm saying? But, But all of a sudden, they say, hey, will you do this for me? And the son just flat out says, no. Okay. But later on, what happens? He starts feeling convicted about it. He starts feeling convicted about it. You know what? My father just asked me to go out into the fields. Maybe I should go. Maybe I should go. And then he gets up and goes. The other son stayed back with an empty promise. This guy had an executed promise. It was going to be executed. It means that it was going to be done. When he said it, he was going to do it. Right. So sometimes we say it out of our mouths that we're going to do it, but make empty promises with our feet. Sometimes we don't say it out of our mouth, but then make the promise come through by walking the walk. You see, the problem is, is quit talking so much and telling people who you are and what you are and quit bragging that I'm a Christian and I'm doing all this and that. Show people that you're a Christian. Show people that you are. Execute your promise to God saying, God, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do exactly what you told me to do. Jesus went up to Matthew, the tax collector, one of the most hated people in that time, a tax collector, a Jew that would go and work for the Roman government and take and uh, uh, charge uh, uh, more taxes than what he should to his own fellow Jews. And he would take that extra money and pocketed it. The Jews couldn't stand him. So the religious leaders were Jewish people. And all of a sudden, when Jesus says, follow me, Matthew, come with me. Follow me, Matthew. You know what the Bible says when he says, follow me? You know what? Y'all shouldn't believe me. Uh, Y'all going to look it up. Where's it at? I done lost it. Somebody look up Matthew the tax collector for me. 
I should have thought. Somebody's got your phone. Google it real quick. When you find it, tell me where it's at. I think it's in Matthew chapter 9. Somebody check Matthew chapter 9 for me. Make sure if I'm right. Sorry, I should have had that. It's all right. Matthew chapter 9. Am I right? Come on, I need an amen somewhere. I'm feeling like 9-9. Nine, nine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for helping me remember where that was. Matthew 9-9. Nine, nine. Ready? Verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. He didn't say, here, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, all right, I want you to get up. I want you to pack up all your belongings. I want you to follow me for three years on this earth. I want you to walk with me. I want you to do all this stuff. There's nowhere in Scripture that he explains what you're going to be doing. All he saw was that his Savior, Jesus, came up to him and said, follow me. That's all. You see, you're talking about a promise, an executed promise, that he don't even know what everything's going to be about. I don't even know what you're going to do with me, Lord. That's when you start walking for the Lord. God, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but you called me to do it. I'm going. You see, the problem is, is that we want to keep more on the empty promise. We're okay with that. We like to make ourselves look good. It's that pride thing. Oh, I'll do it. and Make yourself all look all good, and then don't do it. Then you lose your integrity. What does he say to us? So he arose. What does it say? And followed him. He arose and followed him. Check it out. Matthew sitting at the tax. At his tax booth. Doing his work. He's working now. Doing what he knows that he's been able to do all along. And he's sitting there working and working, paying attention to his work. Then all of a sudden, this Jesus fellow walks up to him. He says, follow me. Now, it wasn't no church service that he come and followed him at. He wasn't sitting in a church like you are in a, in a padded chair. He was sitting at work. And he said, follow me. Now, what are you going to do if Jesus was to come up to you and say, follow me? Now, Jesus hasn't physically come down and told me to follow him, but I followed him. He said, follow me, and I got up and left. What are you going to do? The question is, he says, follow me. I'm just resting, y'all. Y'all don't mind me. He says, follow me, follow me, follow me. What did he do? He got up. He didn't say, well, well, hold on, let me find somebody to, to, to work in my office. Let me find somebody to collect those taxes. Let me go tell my boss that I'm going to be gone. You don't get it. You see, he got up straight from his job and said, okay, let's go. That's, the, that's one of the most craziest places in Scripture where somebody just said, I drop everything and I follow you. Wow. Are you kidding me? Follow you? What would we do if Jesus said, follow me? What are we going to do? What are, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to walk away as one of them, yeah? And what's some other things we're going to do? Give me a list. Tell, tell me what you're going to do, God. Tell Jesus, what do you want me to do? Write it down for me. Type it out. And I want it in a book. I want it in a binder. And I want it to know all the rules that you want me to do before I follow you. You know that people come to know Christ and they... And and it might be their first day ever sitting in a church. How does that happen? Well, they don't know about the Bible. But you know what it is? That their heart is open to knowing that Jesus Christ so much. When he says, follow me, some people jump up straight from the first time that they've ever been in church. And they say, hey, I want to know that Jesus. I want to follow that Jesus. You see what I'm saying? And we sit here in church all the time. And he says, follow me, follow me. Follow me, and we sit still. If you're still sitting still today, don't move yet. But, I mean, when it's time, though, and God says, follow me, go. Go. Quit sitting still. God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. And we don't do it. It's an executed promise if we do. I want to make sure that when I follow God, I'm going to do it with everything I got. When I was going into ministry... For the first time, and I've told this story, but for anybody who's new, I just wanted to let you know this. When I told Michelle about it, 
you know, the natural reaction that I thought I was going to get for her was, you want to do what? <laughs> you need your head examined. That's what I expected from her. You know what she said? I believe her. I said, Michelle, what if God calls me to be a missionary over into another country? She said, let's go. She's ready to go. She's ready to go. So if y'all want to ship her off to Africa and be free, just kidding. (laughs) That was wrong. (laughs) But when he says go, go. When he says go, go. And sometimes it's going to be those things that don't even make sense. But when he says go, go. You know what's going to happen? You're either going to have an empty promise. Ready? You're going to have or an executed promise. You're either going to commit your life to the Lord. By the way, you're either going to commit or you're not. It's not a half-hearted. Remember the church of Laodicea? He said, you know what? If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Either you're going to commit or walk away. Commit or walk away. You know what happens? Too many people are just saying, I commit with an empty promise. When he says, follow me, that means you've got to follow and hear what God tells you to do. Now, the third thing, you're going to have the choice of an empty promise, an executed promise. But here's another promise that I want to tell you about. It's an eternal promise. It's an eternal promise. This comes from Jesus Christ. Remember when he said to the rich young ruler, if you'll do this, guess what? You'll inherit eternal life. The thief on the cross, when I'm said, Jesus, remember me in paradise, right? Remember me in paradise. Jesus said, you will see me in paradise. You know why? Because even though he couldn't physically walk off that cross that he was hung on, even though he couldn't do anything else that he could do, all he could do is say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I ain't got but a few hours left. I ain't got long, but I want to follow you in the last days of my life. Follow me. That's what it means. An eternal promise that he's going to say. He said, hey, this eternal promise is going to be something beyond your imagination. This eternal promise is going to be so good for you that you will never, ever could have dreamed of it. When you say that, hey, you know what? The empty promise, guess what? You're not going to be in that paradise that he's talking about. He can't take nobody that's going to have an empty promise. He's got to take somebody that's fully committed. I hope, well, I'm not hoping. I would hope that there would be a church filled with people that say, I don't have an empty promise. But that's not the case. This group, this size, there's no way. Let me tell you something. If you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, and you back out of it, you never follow Jesus. When I committed my life, Right? When I committed, now when I got saved as an early teenager, I did. I, I went to church. I was already doing a lot of good things. Wasn't like I was doing too many bad things. I was already doing a lot of good things. But when I truly committed and said, I want to follow you now, Lord. I want to go wherever you want me to go. At the age of 24, I never looked back. I didn't say I was perfect. Larry, I know you think I'm perfect, but I'm not. I'm not perfect. But I follow. And I've been following since I'm 24. And you say, well, why would you follow all those years? You know what? Here's where I have a problem with. If you tell me I'm going to lose my salvation. Let me tell you something. A person who actually tasted, actually, and by the way, Psalm 34, 8 says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who trust in him. Do you hear that? Blessed are those who trust in him. When I tasted and seen that the Lord is good, I never wanted to back off of that promise. Do you hear what I'm saying? I know that I'm eternally secure because once I met Jesus Christ, I don't want to go back. All right, there's only a few people with me. I'm glad to see you. I'll see you in heaven. The rest of you going to hell if you don't change it. All right? I'm telling you right now, once you taste it, let me hear if we, we could change the, the, the number that's going to heaven now. Once you taste Jesus Christ, you'll never go back. All right, now there's more people going to heaven. Praise God. Listen, when we know that there's an eternal promise, we can't say that we're going to follow and don't follow through with it. Here's the thing about it. I want you to imagine this in your mind, if you will. 
Jesus had been beaten down, beaten down to a pulp. You saw, if you saw the Passion of the Christ, you saw probably what, or at least close to what he looked like. He was beat down to a pulp. He was walking up the hill of Golgotha, ready to go to the place of the skull, to be crucified on that cross, carrying his own, his own, own execution device, carrying it on his shoulder as he's walking. Now, I want you to imagine that in your scene. Now, pause right there, back up even before that. You know what happened? Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying. Praying so hard till the drops of blood came down, and he busted the blood vessel that he was, he was praying so hard. And he said this, God, please take this cup of suffering away from me. You hear what I'm saying? You're listening now, right? And he prayed it three times. God, please take this cup of suffering away from me, but not as I will, but as you will. You know what? Jesus could have said, I ain't going through with this. He knew what was about to face him. He could have said, I'm not doing it. As he was on the hill carrying that cross, being beat down, he could have dropped the cross and said, I'm done. Walked away from it. If Jesus would have not fulfilled the promise of the word of God, you know what? We'd all be destined for hell. He Walked up that hill, couldn't carry his cross all the way, he fell down. Had Joseph come, uh, one of the guards got him to carry it the rest of the way. But he did not back down on his promise. He did not back down on his promise. And because of this eternal promise that we've had in the beginning, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the book of Genesis, that God promised that there's going to be somebody for us. There's going to be somebody that's going to come and is going to die for our sins. You hear, that eternal promise is why I don't have an empty promise. You got me? That's why I executed the promise that I told God that I was going to do when I was at the age of 24, when I threw my hands up and I said, God, we're going to go. Let's go. That's the promise. But so many times we back away from it. So many times we just walk away. I want to tell you this because... If I was to let you just keep walking on through life and just saying that, oh, I'm, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, one of those false teachings that's out there. If you didn't follow Christ, you ain't going to heaven. If you did not, you hear me? If you did not fulfill your promise and start walking and start being Christ-like and start walking toward, you didn't know Jesus Christ. If you ever turn your back and just quit going to church and said, I'm done with this. I don't want nothing to do with God. I don't believe in him anymore. You never knew Christ. Again, I'm going to tell you that one scripture, Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I tasted it. Have you? The Lord is better than I can ever imagine. And I'm not turning back to that cruel world out there. You hear me? your choice today. Let's pray.